guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Not one man in Israel, not one of God's people, I'll do it. David, you're no soldier, you're a shepherd. Yes, a shepherd. As I protect my sheep, God will protect me. Where is your faith? Where is your God? That was my giant. My enemy that I had to stand up and face. What's yours? Because... All of you have had to face enemies and giants in your life. Maybe you're facing one right now. Look, you might have had giants of health issues, giants of financial problems, giants of doubt. And like Goliath, your giants, your enemies, they come just to mock you, to intimidate you, to shake and tame your faith. Friends, you have two choices. You, you can either give into fear, doubt, and unbelief, or you can do what I did and speak back to your giants in faith, knowing that through power and supplication, we send our request known to an all-powerful God. And he will go before you and defeat your opponent. You tell whatever you're facing that they are not bigger than your God. You tell your giant that the greater one is inside of you and you will be victorious in the name of the Lord. And this is how I defeated my giant. Lord, you have been with me with the bear. You gave me courage and strength with the lion. And now I know that you'll be with me to slay this giant. My faith is in you. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And you prepare my table before in the name of my enemies. Give him one more big hand. They did such a great job. You know what? We're starting uh, a new series, but it's not really a series, but it is a series. We're calling it Wild Card, and that means that for the next uh, four weeks, we are going to be preaching and teaching on all kinds of subjects. There really is no subject, and today I wanted to focus on, on faith. And, um, and I'm sure we've all read the story of David and Goliath, but I want to bring out some, some truths and, uh, and maybe some things from a different angle that maybe you've never seen before. And, uh, and just prepare yourself. And I believe that this is the season where God wants us to upgrade our faith. God wants us to, to go to the next level with our faith. But we also need to understand that beyond just being an emotional driven church, which most of America's church is very emotionally driven. We want to go from being emotional to being very steadfast, very well-grounded, rooted in God's word, and really understand how we can accomplish what God wants us to do in this life by faith. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the word, the word that brings life, the word that brings truth, but your word that also brings transformation. I pray, Father, that today we came with ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart ready to receive the implanted word of God that literally changes our soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Well, you know, I, I love that, that whole clip of David and Goliath, and, um, and it's, it, it relates a lot to the church. And I want you to just for a moment just think about the story as if 
it was a church service. And, uh, and we're, we're facing some things in life because I believe every single one of us has some form of giant right now that you're facing, whether it's maybe financial debt, maybe it's, uh, you know, business problems, maybe it's career issues, uh, maybe it's family problems, marriage problems, children. I don't know what, what the, the issue may be or what the giant um, may be standing before you, but one of the, the things that I, I love about this story is um, it's really a message of faith because when you hear Goliath, and uh, I know that we this is from the Bible story, the, if you've ever seen the movie or the, or the documentary, uh, they take out a portion of the Bible where literally Goliath is facing David and he and, and the people of Israel, and he says, where is your God? Where is your faith? And, and, and the one that really stuck out to me is the one when he said, um, is there no one among you that can actually take the courage and, and have the faith to step up? And I think that that's what the enemy does to you and I. The enemy loves to, to mock the very person that you are in Christ Jesus. And, and whatever it is that you're facing right now is literally telling you, do you not even have the courage to step up? Where is your God in this situation? Where is your faith? And the enemy loves to get us in this place. And um, I, I love David's story because here you have this, this scrawny little kid who shows up. And Kale did a great job, by the way. Didn't he do a great job? He's awesome. And um, he looks like a little David. But uh, uh, David shows up on the scene. And um, when David shows up in this, in this valley where, where King Saul and, and all the military were, it was interesting if you look at it because um, David saw these people paralyzed with fear. And, and he couldn't understand why they were so scared. Because here's the reality. You're not just looking at a story about a king named Saul and a whole military that were secular far away people from God, unbelievers. We're talking about people that worship God. I mean, they literally would have the ark and they would have worship services like you and I right now. They would come and they would have messages of encouragement, empowerment. So these were, these were Christians. If you want to just kind of bring it to today's terminology, these were believers. And, and what happened was in this, in this context of the story, if you really want to expand some revelation, David shows up and he's just dumbfounded how, how they got so comfortable. I mean, the, the people of God got so comfortable with, with, with this valley that they begin to pitch up tents. Okay, they, they, they put their fires and, and they had uh, fathers sending their sons like David, bringing them food every single day. They were bringing them cheese and bread. And so everyone in the camp was just so comfortable. And, and they're in the midst of this huge battle. They're Goliath. And every single day, Goliath is coming out and he is mocking them. He is mocking their God. He's mocking their faith. He's mocking even what they believe in. Every single day. And David shows up and he's just like, what the heck? What is wrong with you guys? And, of course, you know, you know the story. He goes up to, to the guys. He said, hey, so, you know what? Um, what do you get if you, if you take down this giant? They said, well, you know what? You'll never have to pay taxes to the IRS again. <laughs> you know, and you get the honey and some money. <laughs> and, and so David was just like, man, this, this sounds like a win-win situation. And so, of course, we know the story. He begins to have a conversation with, with Saul, and Saul begins to look at his stature, and he says, listen, man, your talk is big, but your frame is small. And, but, 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 check out, but check this out. It's amazing how the, the, the people of Israel also had a talk, but the, they had the wrong talk. The, the conversations they were having when David showed up is instead of them, the people of God, the military talking about how awesome their God was, the God that they constantly were setting up, you know, at, uh, the ark to worship and their services, 
they, they were describing, instead of their God, they were describing how big their Goliath was. And everywhere David went, all he heard was Goliath this, Goliath that, and Goliath this, and Goliath that. And David was just a little bit shocked because he's thinking, wait a minute. How, how, what is wrong with you guys? And so as I look at, at the church today in, in our society here in America, I think that the church talks more about their Goliaths than they do about their God. I mean, David came with a galactic God. He's like, what is wrong with you guys? My God is bigger. My God is greater. So it wasn't that, that David, made, he didn't have the frame or the build like a lot of these soldiers or even like King Saul. But let me tell you what he did had. He had big faith. He had big trust. He had huge confidence. He had confidence in his God. As a matter of fact, we know the story when he's standing before uh, Goliath. He tells him, hey, listen, you, you uncircumcised Philistine. That was cussing back then, right? You uncircumcised Philistine. You know what? Who do you think you are to come and torment the armies of God? I mean, his confidence was not in his build. His confidence was in the Lord. And so many times we as, as believers, we as people, we put more confident, confidence in our checkbook, in our paychecks. We put more confidence in what we can attain in our own strength, in our own wisdom, in our own talent, in our own giftings. But let me tell you this. That can only get you so far. But we're talking about how can we come to the place where we really take Hebrews 11.6, where it says, and this is the only way you can please God, by faith. There's only one way to please God, it's by your faith. And sorry, that's the wrong verse, guys. I don't know what you guys are doing. We're not even there yet. But help them, Lord. Uh, but but I'm, I'm telling you right now, there's only one way. If you want to please God, okay, if you want to please God, he says that he who comes to God must believe that he is God. And that is a reward of those who what? Diligently seek him. And so faith is the only thing that you and I can do to actually get God in the place where he's just like, wow, I'm well pleased with you. And so David, he shows up on the scene of, of this, this situation, this, this, this problem, and he's bringing his, his, the, the bread and cheese like all the other brothers that were coming. But the difference was that David was, was in conflict on the inside of himself because he was thinking, how is this possible that the armies of God would be afraid of a, of a Goliath like this? And, uh, and I love this. So how, how, what does that look like for us today? Because I know that David, for him, as he stood by and he brought Goliath down, he, he, he didn't do it in his own strength. He said, today, Goliath, I'm going to knock your butt down in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? That's how he approached him. Uh, you know, and, and I, I love the word because uh, my mind is very creative, and I create my own stories when I read the Bible. Like, I can literally picture things. I encourage you to do that because it just comes more to life. But I can only imagine what, what was happening when they finally let David, the scrawny little guy who, whom no one believed in, and they said, okay, fine, go ahead. And I can only imagine the guy with binoculars just seeing him walk out to the field. And, and King, the king right there saying, hey, is he really doing it? Uh, yeah, man, he's going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is he down yet? <laughs> uh, no, he's still walking. Uh, is he there yet? Uh, almost. Okay. What's he doing now? Uh, he's saying a lot of words. He's, what's happening now? Goliath has this look of just dumbfoundedness, like who in the world is this kid? And I bet King just kept asking, what's happening now? I bet it got to the point, and this is my own little head, that it got to the point where he said, is, he, did, did, is David dead yet? Is he down yet? Actually, no. David is, I don't know, he's swinging his arm like, like he's saying, whoop, there it is. I don't, I don't know. Like, like, <laughs> and, and he's like, what's happening now? Uh, wait a minute. Goliath, he's going down. What? Well, he's either taking a nap or he's going down. And then he's like, are you serious? Yeah. Oh, and he starts going, oh, oh, ooh. And King's part, he, what, what, what's happening? What's he doing? Oh, ooh. He's, he's sawing the head off of Goliath. I mean, just think about 
David, David, man, when he showed up, he didn't come with physical confidence. He came with spiritual confidence. Man, he came with such faith, knowing that his God was good. It wasn't his physical ability. It was the ability that God gave him with supernatural strength and power to take him down. God can do things that, that, that only he can do through you that you can't do for yourself. And so when you think about this and you begin to understand, wow, this story is really talking about faith. Look at what Hebrews 11.1 1 says. Now you guys can go to Hebrews. Hebrews 11.1 1 says this. And, and it's the NLT, but I, I, I brought uh, two of the words that come from the original um, uh, of just the, the context of this scripture. It says faith shows or faith is. Faith shows or faith is. So let's just understand what really is faith. Because if you don't understand what faith is, you'll, you'll never be able to operate in healthy faith. You'll operate more in hope than you ever do in faith. And so it says, faith shows the reality, or another word for reality, is faith is the substance. Everybody say substance. That, that means that, that faith, faith does not operate by itself. Faith does not function alone. Faith is the actual substance. I mean, just think about substance. Substance is something that you can tangibly, you know, it see. So faith shows or faith is the substance of what we, what, hope for. Okay. But it's also the evidence of things that we cannot. And it's shocking because most of the things hopefully that you and I are believing for are things that we can't see. Um, if you need healing, you may not have healing right now. But faith says, but I can see myself being healed. For example, I remember when I was, you know, sick in the hospital, one of the biggest issues I had was I could not breathe for myself because after having surgery, I lost my right diaphragm. And I had a lot of, a lot of lung complications. And I had both my lungs filled with fluid and then one collapsed. And so anyways, it was just a horrible thing. Well, I finally had my lungs in a good place. But I had an oxygen tank in order for me to breathe. And so I was walking around with this tank for a while in the hospital. And, and I remember every single day just believing God. And I would take off the, the, the oxygen mask. And I would be like, yes. And I would just start walking out as if I'm going to go for a stroll in the hospital. But as I kept taking more steps, I felt like I was going to faint. And I'd have to run back to bed. Why? Because here's the reality. Um, I didn't have... I didn't have my healing, but I was able to see my healing. And every single day, I just kept trying. And I kept taking it off. And I, I want to be honest with you. I, I wish I could tell you that, man, it was awesome. I, I, I had the victory the first day. No, every single day was hard. But every single day, it got just a little bit easier in my faith and trust in the Lord. Just knowing that, man, I know God can do this. So, so faith shows faith is the reality. It's the substance of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. Let me give you a, a, a Mauricio definition. And you guys can put this up. It's my first point. Faith becomes a bridge from where I am and where I want to go. So faith is simply my external hope of what I want to see happen. All right. So faith becomes a bridge. Faith. Faith, what am I believing for? Okay, I'm believing that God is going to heal my lungs. Am I healed of my lungs? No. Um, it, what's your challenge? I have an oxygen mask uh, on my face, okay? But what do you see, Mauricio? You know, I see myself no longer walking or living with this mask, and I can literally see myself breathing on my own. Mind you, they came with the contradiction of what I was believing for. They said, you may have to use an oxygen tank for the rest of your life. And I just had to make a decision to say, you know what, that's not what I'm believing for. What I'm believing for is, and I started describing what to God what I want to see him do. So faith became my bridge from where I am. I may not be where I want to be, but I'm on my way. But I'm on my way. And of course, Obviously, I'm here today, no oxygen tank. God did amazing things, but it was by, by faith. So faith is your greatest substance. Faith is your greatest substance. Faith should be more real to you than whatever you can do in your own strength. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. 
come on, how many just people do I have in the house today? Then you are called to live by faith. If the disciples of Jesus Christ were here today, they would tell you and I, there is no possible way that you can live this life, that you can, that you can uh, uh, allow life that, and all the challenges it brings to you and think that you're going to be able to, uh, to conquer it or even get the victory with your own strength. They would tell you it's by faith that we were able to be persecuted. It was by faith that we were able to trust God in the worst scenarios, in the worst situation. It was by faith when we had to give up our life in order for you to have the Bible that's in your hands today. It was by faith the just shall live by faith. Now, here's another scripture. I want you to see this. I'm going to lay a little foundation, and then I want to break some things down. In 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says, for we what? Walk by faith. Everybody say, I walk by faith. Not by what? I walk. Every single day is interesting. You and I are always, we're walking. We're going places. We're doing things. Every single one of you are on a journey. You're going somewhere. Well, God is saying, when, when you're walking with me every single day, I'm expecting you to have an expectation of something that you want to see me do in your life. Every single one of us. I mean, what are you believing God for? Sometimes we're so consumed, okay, like the people of Israel. They were so consumed with their giant that they went from worshiping God to worshiping giant. They knew more about their giant than they did about their God. Come on, they can describe what time the giant went to sleep, what time the giant woke up, what time the giant ate, what time the giant hung out with his homies, his friends, what time the giant came out and scared them and said, boo, and then everybody would run. They, they described the giant like he was bigger, badder, and greater than God. That's what happens with the church today. Come on, talk to most Christians. It's funny because sometimes people say counseling meetings with me. And I'll sit with them, and they want counsel regarding something, and I'm telling them nothing different that I already preached about. That just, tell, that just tells you that we have a society, we have a culture, we have a church in America that just feels their way through their walk with God instead of have faith in God. We just feel. We feel. We're emotional. And listen, nothing wrong with emotions. God gave you that wonderful gift. But if you're just this emotional basket case where that's all you trust, you make your emotions your God. It becomes your Goliath. In other words, your feelings are greater than your father. Your feelings are greater than your God. And you can't trust what you feel. You can't even trust your own heart. It says trust the Lord with all your heart. It doesn't say trust the heart with, you know what I'm saying? It says trust the Lord with all your heart. Not trust your heart with the Lord. So this, this I think today, if we, if we really take a seat and we really begin to understand the, 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 wonder, uh, the wonderful uh, anatomy of faith, and that we begin to really understand that, wow, you know, if the Israelites can go from being God worshipers to Goliath worshipers, I wonder what I'm worshiping right now. Come on. Do you talk more about your problem? Or do you talk more about your God? Do you talk more about your debt? Or do you talk more about your God? Do you talk more about your poverty? Huh? I don't have enough. I don't make enough. And you just keep talking yourself into believing that truth. That really is a lie. See, your lies can become your truth, and God's truth can become your lies. I hope I'm talking to someone today. Uh, thank you. I'll take that one right there. Free latte. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody want a rochata? Huh? <laughs> For we walk by faith, not by. We walk by faith, not by. The problem with the people of Israel is they walk by sight. They Goliath and not by faith. David showed up and he said, no, I walk by faith. He said, the God who gave me the ability to conquer the, the lion and the bear is the same God who's going to give me the victory over this uncircumcised Philistine. He's going down today. You see, you got to see whatever it is your faith. You got to see that sucker down already. You have to see it already. You have to believe it. And so here's a point out of 2 Corinthians 5, 7. The opposite of faith is sight. 
And so if you're a person that you're always just believing, like, God, I'll believe me when you show me. God will be like, nope, you'll believe me <laughs> because you'll believe me. No, God, just, just sh show me a sign. And I believe in signs and wonders and miracles, but I think we're asking for all the wrong signs. Like, God's just saying, hey, listen, would you just trust me? Can you just believe me? For Will you stop questioning me? And so, in other words, you could either walk by faith or you could walk by depression. You could either walk by faith or you can walk by feelings. Or you could either walk by faith or you can walk by fear. And, and we have to understand that the issue with, with the church is that there's just so much fear. And fear has a lot of different faces. It doesn't all look the same. You know, some of us were too afraid to step into a new career because you're so comfortable with, with what you've been doing for so long. Listen, it happens. The Israelites were comfortable. They were never going to fight. They were just going to sit there and act like they were Christians for the rest of their life until someone showed up and made a change. I don't want to be the church that's just sitting down and we're just having church every weekend, having worship, and, and we're not conquering anything. We need to take some land. Come on. It's so interesting how we have so much faith in the promises. Like there are people here that, that man, you're like, man, I, 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 I love the promise of being married one day. I, I love the promise of, of, of having that career one day. I love the promise of getting my health. I love the, we love the promises more than we love the promise, sir. And the promise becomes your God. And you start living for the promise and you start just, just not only living for it, you breathe it. You're just so consumed with the promise that you forgot the promise, sir. I don't worship the promise. I worship the promise, sir. That's the place we got to come back to. And so the people of Israel were just stuck on promise, but they forgot the promise, sir. You know why? Because the promise doesn't make the change God does. David came with the correct theology. You're going down in the name of the Lord. Everybody else was saying, you're going down. <laughs> you're not going down. So we got, we got to come back to this, this understanding. Now, um, let's just talk about the, the, the root of fear real quick for a second. Because if you don't understand the different faces of fear, there are some things in your life that you'll never see God do for you. And that can be per, even personal healing. I think sometimes we put more faith in our trauma than we do our God. Okay, and I believe, there's, I believe in trauma. I believe in PTSD. I believe in all those things. They're real things, but don't make it your God. Um, and so when you think about the very beginning, when you, when you, when you go back to Genesis, you look at, at, at God creating man. And it's awesome because when God created man, he created him and her so perfect. You know, he created a perfect garden for them. It was so perfect. It was like the utopia. It was just so beautiful, just perfect, perfect fruit. You know what I'm saying? You didn't have lopsided apples like, you, you know, we do today. It was just perfect. Just, just everything's, our fruit is so jacked up today. You know, you bite it, you know, it's disgusting. Man, back then it was just perfect, perfect fruit, perfect animals. There was no violence. There was no cancer. There was no divorce. There was no dysfunction. Function. It was perfect fellowship with God every day. Look, it was so perfect that the garden had AC. It did. I promise you it did. Look, it said, the Bible says this, and God the Father walked with them in the garden in the cool of the day. It was eight. I mean, it was perfect. They never, never, ever broke a sweat. Keep reading the scriptures. If you really read the Bible and you begin to understand God made it so perfect that these people didn't even sweat. But when sin came in, sweat came in. It does. It says, and then they had the toil, the ground, and the sweat and the brow came in. I mean, that's how perfect God was. So just think for a second. So they had perfect fellowship, perfect relationship. They had perfect faith, perfect trust. They, 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 everything was just perfect, yet they were butt naked. Just naked, just, just like whatever, just like, hey, good morning. Just, just, 
Everybody say pink elephant. Watch it, man. All right, think of yourself. Just butt naked, just like, hey, good morning. How's it going, honey? Yeah, good. Just, just naked. Perfect. But check this out. But within that perfection, God begins to set some rules. And he says, hey, listen, everything I've done for you, I've done it perfectly. The only thing I ask you, and, and this will mess up a lot of people because so many people are like, well, why did God allow? God gives you a perfect will for your life. And then there's the permissible will of your life where you get to choose. And he says, hey, listen, you can have everything here that I made perfect for you. But from that tree, that tree right there, that tree is called good and evil. I don't want you to touch that tree. And isn't it amazing how the very thing that God forbids is the very thing that attracts us? The very thing that God has forbidden for, from us to have is the very thing that always pulls your desire. Why is that? Because there is a deceiver who comes to make your faith imperfect. But there's one, and his name is Jesus, who comes to perfect your faith. And so, so here's what happens. So they're, they're, they're like, okay, God, okay. Like all of us do in church, amen, pastor, amen. Amen, yeah, amen. And, and check this out. And then within that perfect garden, then came the little punk snake fool named Satan. He comes in and he slithered himself inside. And he begins to have a dialogue, a conversation. Just like the people of Israel, they started with a little dialogue. It was just a little conversation before it just all just blew up. And then everybody had the same language of fear. And, and Satan came to the woman. And then, of course, the man too. But the woman, he said to her, hey, why don't you eat from that tree that God told you that you couldn't have anything from? And then he didn't even let her respond. He says, I'll tell you why. Because the day that you eat from it, your, 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 your eyes will be open and you will be as wise and as awesome as God. And God doesn't want you to have that. And so you know what he was basically telling her? He was telling her this. He was saying, hey, listen, what you really want is more. What you really have right now is not enough. And that's just like so many of us Christians, we're never satisfied with what God has given us. So we're always looking for more, only to find ourselves back in dissatisfaction or finding ourselves back into sin because it just, it's not enough. And so Satan was simply whispering to her, what you have right now is not enough. In other words, God, God is not enough for you. There's something beyond what God gave you. And we know that then man came and he was deceived. And we, we see this story. Go with me real quickly to Genesis chapter 3. Are you guys here? And so we, we, we see that, that basically he's telling him, you're, you're lacking right now, guys. That's what he was telling him. You're lacking right now. And look what he says in Genesis 3, verse 7 through 10. It says, and every say at that moment. <laughs> see, see, the enemy is just waiting for at that moment. He's just waiting for that moment where you are so frustrated, where you're just so angry. Man, where you're just so mad because, you know what, you ain't getting your promise. And it's at that moment. It says, and at that moment, look at this. Their eyes were what? I... I I walk by what? Not by what? So guess what was over now? Sight. This was the fall of faith. Now this is where man began to walk by sight. Look, let's keep reading. And they suddenly, everybody say suddenly. So listen, not, once, your, once their eyes, once their eyes were open, our eyes were open. It says and once their eyes were open, suddenly they felt what? Shame. Interesting. It's the first thing they felt. You know why? Because our eyes plagiarize. And when we begin to use these eyes for different things, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, when our eyes is never satisfied, we want more. Have you ever wanted something so bad, then you get it and you're just like, huh, so what? Huh? 
Come on, you finally got that car you've been believing God for. Praise God. You, 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 you couldn't wait for that brand new car smell. <sighs> ah. And then, you know, two months go by, you don't even wash it anymore. You don't even give a rip about it. Why? And you're already looking at another car. You're like, dang, when I get that one. I should have got that. I knew I should have got it. Why didn't I get leather? Why? These eyes are never satisfied. Their eyes were what? Open. And then what happens? Then shame. Shame came in. Thank you. I can do that alone. You're awesome. <laughs> shame came in. And look, and at their naked, see, they saw shame. They felt shame at their, they, what they felt, they started feeling now. Now they're feeling shame. They're feeling, man, we're, look, look, we're naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. And it says, and when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord walking about in the garden. So they did what? They hid themselves from God. They hid themselves from God among the trees. And then the Lord, God called to them and he says, where are you? Where, 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 what happened? And see, I'm here to tell you today, in the midst of your giant, where are you? Where is Elevate? What, 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 where, where is the church? Where, where, where is the, the body when we need the body? Where are we? And God is saying, where are you? Where are you? Look what they respond. And it says, and he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. So I hid. How is it that we hide from the one who, who provides all perfection? How is it that we can hide? I'll tell you why. Because once... Once shame came in because of the attraction that we had, it keeps us from ever coming to that full relationship with God. And then the Bible says right there, and this is the first, the first time you hear the word, I was what? Afraid. This was the first time the word fear was ever spoken of in the Bible. In Genesis chapter 3. Can you believe that? That was the birth of fear. They said, because of our fear, man, we were scared. We actually, what used to be perfect is no longer perfect. So what happens with us? You know what? We hit a place in our life where, and this is before Christ and even during Christ, you, you, you hit places, seasons in your life where things that you've done, maybe sometimes you've doubted God, you, 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 you disobeyed God, you, you did what you wanted to, you were, you were distracted with the attraction of something you shouldn't have, and now you have so much shame and guilt and condemnation that you're wondering, why? Why am I having this issue with faith? Why can't I just believe God like all these other people? Because shame keeps hiding you from God's presence. And that's why Romans 8, 1 says, and there is no condemnation to those who are, in Christ, who are in Christ Jesus. Satan comes to deceive you and tell you, you're not right. You're not good. And, and, and that's the stuff that keeps you from ever coming in healthy, genuine faith where you can actually come like a David and, and, and speak up on behalf of your God, and it's not on behalf of you, but you're actually coming on behalf of God saying, man, this thing is going down. It, it, it's coming down. I don't, you don't have to be afraid of this. See, this was the birthing of fear, but God's saying, hey, where are you? I have forgiven you. I have loved you. I have, there's just so much that God has done for us, but we're still living in the garden. We got to break the curse of the garden in our life. How? Well, we got to put faith in Christ's finished work. Jesus already crushed. He said, I've destroyed all the works of the devil. But it's so interesting how many of us are still living under the condemnation and the shame of our sin, of our stuff that is literally hindering the faith. And then we're expecting or we're upset or we're angry at God. Why isn't my family healed? Why am I not seeing this? Why am I not seeing that? Because we're too busy. Come on, worshiping all of our issues instead of worshiping the promiser who has the answer and who is the answer. We got to come back. Where are you? Come out from those trees. Come, from, come out from that shame and let God begin to heal. This is the first time. And, and here's what I'm scared of with the church so much. And, and this is not to condemn anyone. But I've been around long enough with Christians for 22 years. 
And God has gone from that first experience of just like, man, I love God, to now he's treated like Santa Claus. Give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. And we have this spirit of give me, give me, give me like he's Santa Claus without really seeking the fundamental truths of the power of Christ and having faith in him in order for us to see the breakthrough, the blessing, the healing. We, we have such an emotional body now that, that they don't understand. For example, like I've heard people say, you know, Pastor, I show up late and I, you know, God bless you, man. I love you guys. But it just kind of, it irritates me when I hear people say, man, I don't like coming during worship. They don't, they don't play music that I like. Or, or, man, I didn't like that song today. And I start thinking, okay, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I didn't realize it was about you. Uh, next time, I'll make sure we got your iTunes jam on here at Elevate. And, and then we'll start playing the music you want to hear. And, and don't get me wrong, I get it. I get it. And there's nothing wrong with, with wanting uh, uh, an experience, which, which I, I'm a big believer in that. Like, let's create an environment for everyone to worship. But not when it's all a feeling you're a feeler, you're not a faither. Like in other words, I got I gotta feel. I, I gotta I I gotta feel God in order for me to believe that there's God in here. But but God's saying, no, I, I want you to create an altar in your heart for me, whether it's the song you like or not. And I want you to faith me in that moment and begin to worship me and not worship you. And I, I'm telling you that, that the more you worship you, the more that you're self-absorbed with you, the more shame you're going to have and the less confidence you're ever going to have in order to see yourself coming out of whatever you're in. Come on, you won't have the confidence. You won't have the faith. You won't have the trust. You know why? Because you've made a mountain of your issues. Let's keep talking. Can we talk? Can we just talk just a little bit more? I'm almost done. Okay? So we have to understand that we can only bring things to pass by faith. And uh, here's what happens. Go with me real quick to uh, Luke 22. This is very good. Because I know that like so many of us, um, I need my faith the strongest when my fear is the loudest. I, I really do. I need my faith the strongest when my fear is the loudest. It's almost like... Like fear picks up a microphone in my life sometimes. And it just starts talking, man. Especially at, at, at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Have you ever woken up in the middle of the night where all of a sudden, man, you had the spirit of fear coming to you telling you you're going to die. You're, you're, you're not going to come out of this. You're going to stay there. And you know what? That's what happened with David and Goliath. Goliath got a hold of Israel's mic. And he just started rapping his own jams saying, you know what, where are you at? Where is your God? And he just kept going every single night. They had open mic night with Goliath. And they're all just there sitting there just listening to the lies. Well, that's what happened with Eve. Come on, Satan came in with his whisper, but it was louder than her faith. And he began to just contradict what God already said to her. Come on, we got to take the mic back. And we have to go ahead and start speaking truth. And we need to start speaking life to whatever it is we're facing. We need to start taking courage back. And not just being people that feel our way through life, but people that live by faith. That we, the just shall live by faith. That we walk by faith, not by sight. I don't know what you're looking at right now. I don't know what you're facing right now. But I know, man, God is awesome. I'm telling you. He'll do it for you. He's just looking for someone that will believe him. You know, yesterday we had our, our, our uh, um, ride for Christ, a motorcycle ride. And it was so much fun. I, I often don't get to do it. But yesterday, man, I cleared my schedule and said, I'm going. I, I went with the guys. But when we were in our circle praying before we left, um, we were praying and just asking God for protection and whatever. But underneath my tongue, I was praying, God, would you set something up today? Would you do something where we can actually, you know, come across someone that, that needs Jesus? I was thinking more like, hey, let's evangelize, you know, let's share the gospel with someone. But let me tell you, yesterday, when we were riding, 
uh, this guy on, on one of the turns at 60 miles an hour, he went flying off his bike. And, uh, and I guess like five cars passed him by, no one stopped for him. And, and then our crew, we showed up and we stopped and, and the guy was, you know, at, um, he was pretty jacked up. And, and just kind of felt like he was like very cold, anxi- he, had, he had an anxiety attack, all kinds of stuff. And we had to throw him on, on, on one of the guy's bikes and, and we had to bring him down the mountain because there was no cellular service, nothing. So we're, we're bringing this guy down the mountain and uh, a few times uh, Jose was saying, man, I thought this guy was going to pass out and fall off the bike. And uh, it was wild, but we took him into the hospital, Henry Mayo, they took him into trauma and, uh, and, and you know, the, the family showed up, but he was in, in the room and he was talking about, like, these guys saved my life. These guys saved my life. It was pretty awesome. But I just thought, my God, it just starts with one simple prayer. God, just place me in the right place at the right time. God, I'm just praying. Just do, what if we all started praying things like that? I wonder what kind of setups. I wonder what kind of God appointments God will set you up in. Now, did God drop this dude off the bike? No. But, but, but he found a group of guys who were willing and ready at any moment to do whatever it was. Now, of course, uh, later on uh, yesterday in the night, he texts me, the guy, and he's like, thank you so much. He was just so thankful. He's like, thank you so much, man. I really appreciate it. He's like, if you need anything at all, anything, man, I'll take you guys to I'm like, oh, anything? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, you know what? He didn't know I was a pastor. He didn't even know we were a Christian. We prayed for him when we were there at the accident. But I told him, like, hey, listen, yeah, you can totally do something for me. Hey, why don't you come to church with me and the guys? Um, and, and then we'll get food afterwards. He's like, oh, okay. He's like, okay, great. He's like, let me get good this weekend. Uh, I'll call you next weekend. We'll do this thing. And I'm just thinking, look at that. See, that's faith. Faith is just, just asking God, God sent me up. What if you as a business owner or someone who has a career just say, God, you know, this week just help me to just be a little bit better, Father. This week, set me up with a new appointment. Set me up with divine favor. Just do some. God's just looking for people to believe him. God's just, he's just waiting for someone to be just wild and be like, you know what? I'm going to do some big stuff for God. And then God shows up on the scene. You know why? Because at the end of the day, you know who it brings glory to? God. On that day, when Goliath went down, man, though everybody was cheering David on, David put the attention back on his God. And he said, man, this was my God. And from start to finish, people heard what he spoke. And he said, today, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, this Goliath is going down. It's awesome when people can say, how do you do it? And I do it by faith. I trust God. I believe God. Amen. Let me give you a, a, a few more verses and we're done. Luke 22, 31 and 32 says this. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed. Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat. But look at this. But I have prayed for you, that your faith should not what? Check that out. So in other words, in this context of story, Jesus already knew that Peter was going to fail him. This is the story where Jesus starts telling him, hey, listen, you're going to deny me three times. And, of course, Peter's like, no, I'll never deny you. You know, talking all that big talk. And then, of course, when the time came, he denied him. And, of course, what happened, what came into Peter's life? Shame. He was so shameful that he got himself out of the ministry and went back to work as the fisherman where God found him to begin with. Shame will take you back if you're not careful. will take you back where God delivered you from. It will take you right back. Take you back to addictions take you back to old mindsets, take you back to old relationships that God set you free from. Shame will just take you right back. But notice here it says, hey, listen, but Peter, yeah, the enemy has sifted you. It's like your Goliath, Satan, your Goliath and you, man, there's a showdown going down. But he says, but, 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 don't, don't worry about it. Have no fear. I prayed. I prayed for you that your faith would not fail you. You know what Jesus was saying? I just want you to believe me that I already conquered the season you're in right now. In other words, Jesus already went before you. Whatever it is that you have faced through life, God was never shocked about it. But God is just waiting for you to believe him that he already conquered that season. Now, you just have to have the faith to believe that 
I got this thing. It's almost like a fixed fight. Like you're about to go throw down, but you already know you're going to win. How awesome is that? That's what Jesus is saying. He's like, we already won. Can you just have faith? Why do we have to fight then? Because you have a deceiver who will contradict what you should already know. I have already won the fight, but the contradictor will come and whisper and say, no, but you're still lacking. You're not enough. You don't have enough. You need more. This can't just be it. And that's why we have such a dysfunctional body of Christ that we're always looking somewhere else because he's not enough. That's why God's called more than enough. Come on, you don't need more money. You need more Jesus. You don't need more peace. You need more Jesus. Come on, we don't need more miracles. We need more Jesus because if we have more Jesus, we'll need less miracles. If we have more Jesus, we'll need less money. Why? Because I'm telling you, God sets you up divinely. Like, you know what? You'll just be always like, man, I'm just so blessed because I just obey God. And he does it. Not that you won't be challenged, but, but don't complicate faith. Last verse. Look at this. Last verse. Last verse. Quickly. This is in Mark 11, 22. I love this verse. In verse through 20, we'll read to 25. We're done. It says, then Jesus said to the disciples, have faith in what? He didn't complicate it. Jesus was very simple. Hey, guys, have faith in God. Have faith. But nothing's working. That's the problem because you're just so stuck on the promise. The promise is not happening, so now you have no faith in God. He says, have faith in God. I tell you the what? Okay, so he clarifies that. Satan will tell you lies. I will tell you the truth. He says, I tell you the truth. You can say to this mountain, may you be lifted up and thrown into the sea. What mountain? Your Goliath. You can say to this Goliath, you know, sickness, disease, come on, broken relationship, whatever Goliath is in front, you can say, be moved. It's going to take faith, guys. It's going to take faith. It takes faith. He says, be removed and be thrown into the sea, and it will happen. But you must really believe it. It didn't say, but you must really feel it. Because my feelings are always contrary to what I'm trying to believe. My feelings are telling me it ain't going to happen. My feelings are telling me you're never going to get better. My feelings are telling me you suck. My feelings are telling me you're not progressing. But my faith says, no, I am progressing. My faith is saying, I can see it happening. My faith is saying, I can see my victory. My faith is saying, I can receive my healing. But look at this. He says, but you must really believe it. Uh, believe it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for some things, not everything. Is that what it says? He says, you can pray for what? Anything. And if you believe, if you what? If you what? There's an if. If you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven can forgive you. Last part of this. You have to receive it first. When you pray, you have to already, this is real faith, guys, okay? When, when you're saying you're operating faith, you already have to see it in the spirit like it's already done. The problem is that we have too many people are waiting to see something so that they can start having faith in God. God's saying, no, when you pray for anything, you have to believe and you have to receive it already like I already did it for you. And then he says, and the, and the way to do that, <laughs> it's funny how he throws in faith with forgiveness. Because unforgiveness will hinder your faith. Grudges will hinder your faith. That's why when I go to hospitals and either when people are dying or, or people are really sick, I'll, my first question is this. Do you have any unforgiveness towards anyone before you leave this earth? This is already when we know they're going. They've already made a decision. And you know what? It's interesting. Even people that are just sick or going through, I say, do you have any unforgiveness? And most often they just say, they, just, they don't even let me finish and say, no, I'm, I'm good, Pastor. I've forgiven everybody. That's our problem. We're such a talk generation, we're not a think generation. 
we got to think about this and say, my God, do I have any grudges towards anyone? Do I have a grudge towards my parents, my siblings? Do I have a grudge towards, you know what, my friends, my uh, a past hurt? Do I have any unforgiveness? Have you forgiven yourself? You can be your own stumbling block to your promise. Why? You look at you every day. Sometimes you can be your own worship. You worship you. You worship how you feel every day. You worship how you think every day. Like everything's about you. And so God's saying, hey, listen, if we're going to have mounting moving faith, if we're going to have giant moving faith, I want to make sure that you forgive first. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below. And we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.